very good evening to all of you. Uh, on behalf of Team Pimhan, I would like to extend a very warm welcome and thank you all for sparing the time to join us today on our monthly mental health series on uh, mental health awareness. Um, our topic for today is suicide risk, suicide prevention, with special emphasis on the youth population because our current series is on child and adolescent perspectives. And to throw some more light on the topic, we have Ms. Stephen C. Rajput, our expert speaker for today. Ms. Rajput is an able and experienced professional who uses an eclectic mix of techniques with a humanistic approach to finding uh, customized solutions to the challenges presented. And she specializes in working with mood disorders, personality disorders, anxiety, and the panic spectrum in adolescents and adults, uh, ever the beacon of hope and information and knowledge, she is actively involved in the creation and dissemination of mental health related by community. She is also an accomplished public speaker and a mental health journalist uh, who uh, devotes her time to creating awareness and dispelling myths about mental health. Uh, Ma'am, So let's talk about an often ignored topic today, a topic which is rather suppressed and whenever it is talked about, we go about, let's not talk about it, let's, you know, just don't say anything because somebody might actually do it. So today everybody, let's talk about suicide. And as you see on the presentation over there, there's a semicolon. Let me ask you what does it mean? Anybody who would like to respond to that? Pause? Yeah, kind of. It's, it's yeah. trying to emphasize that uh, uh, suicide as a solution is the end. So that would be a full stop. The semicolon means that there is chance to uh, continue. There is, there is, There are chances beyond this as well. Solutions beyond uh, suicide. Absolutely. So today let's talk about that. Let's talk about why talking about suicide is okay, why let's talk about continuation and not full stops. So in today's talk, we'll understand about suicide, we'll talk about how to approach a person who's thinking about suicide, we'll also talk about how to identify the traits, and we'll also talk about how to persuade somebody to take help, and then finally reference, which is meaning how to take somebody to help to a mental health professional or a medical professional. One young person dies by suicide every hour. And that is the latest stats in 2021. And I know it saddens all of us. And all of you over here probably also want to understand it more as mental health we know is the new pandemic. Yes? So let's understand suicide further. Suicide is the most complex and difficult to understand of all human behavior. Yet people think about ending their life every now and then. And the ones who think of it are just like you and me, all of us over here. Any of us at any point of time can actually have a thought related to suicide or ending their lives or just harming themselves or just thinking that life is not worth living. The only difference between going ahead and doing it and not doing it is understanding the problem, how overwhelmed the person is with their problem and how easily you can cope with the problem. So we always mistake suicide for a behavior or a, you know, something that they're doing wrong. <coughs> but if you understand suicide from the perspective of somebody who's actually feeling it, who's feeling that hopeless, you'll understand that suicide is nothing but just a solution derived by a person when they cannot see any other way out. And that is all that is to suicide. Now let's understand that suicide also has its identification traits. It can be verbal, it can be behavioral, there could be indicators and of course, the language that you can understand. So let's talk about it further. 
It can take many, many forms. Some warning signs will be direct and obvious. Something like, I'm going to kill myself. I think I'm going to eat my gun. Life is not worth living. Or even, I don't know, what will I ever do with this life? Might as well end it. I wish a car might hit me. You'll see people talking about, I wish I don't get up tomorrow. I wish somebody else kills me. Or taking risk behaviors such as crossing a very busy road. So, understand that some warning signs that are direct are these. Let's find out some red flags that you can look out for in people if anybody is seeing somebody who is hopeless or helpless. What are the red flags that you can see? The first one is hopelessness. When I say hopelessness, it simply means as if there is no, no hope at all. That my actions will lead to nothing. That there is no solution. Then coming to rage, anger, seeking revenge. So actions filled with rage, impulsive anger, etc. Acting recklessness. Acting reckless or engaging in high risk activities seemingly without thinking. Like I said, walking into a heavy traffic or getting on the top of a building and standing on the ledge of the building. Or uh, in fact, even sometimes just simply buying a gun and trying to, you know, buy bullets or such things. Or even trying to take too many pills or buying poison. It can also be around feeling trapped. They can talk about, I feel trapped, I think I cannot get out of here. I'm helpless, I'm hopeless. There is no solution to it. So whenever you'll see somebody talking about ending their life or feeling like ending their life, you'll always see it as a solution. That this is not happening, my finances are not so good, my work is not doing so good, I, don't, I didn't do well in my exam, I didn't clear certain exam. And all of that is as if there is no other way out. So hence, suicide. But remember, don't call it the easy way out. It's not. Now, also withdrawing from friends, society, increased take of alcohol or drugs, anxiety, agitation, unable to sleep or sleeping all the time. So we also mistake adolescence, sleeping all the time as being lazy. So you will hear parents saying ki our child sleeps a lot. Ye toh bohat lazy hai. Isko kuch aur karna hi nahi hai. Ye hamesha phone pe rehta hai. Aur phir poore din sota hai. Raat ko poore time phone pe rehta hai, poore din sota hai. This is not an indicative of just laziness. It is also an indicative of lot of anxiety and lack of healthy coping skills. This directly points towards avoidance. So whenever you see a young adult or even an adult actually avoiding life in general a lot, it's a red flag. Very anxious, very agitated, getting very very anxious on even little things in say office spaces, getting agitated very easily. Dramatic changes in mood. Today they were very very sad, weren't talking to you, weren't talking to anybody and suddenly they are very very happy. That happiness doesn't mean they're feeling better. That happiness could be indicative of they've taken the final decision. And they've actually gathered the means. No reason for living, no sense of purpose in life. When people talk about, I really don't have anything to live for. The lack of belongingness that we talk later. Now let's talk about suicidal desires. Suicidal ideation is an operationalized form of a construct of suicidal desire. The want to end life. The two psychological states that influence suicidal desire are burdensomeness, sense of low belongingness or social alienation. Now understand when I say burdensome, it is the feeling of as if I am a burden on my family, on my friends, on everybody that is around me. So even though you as a family member might not be perceiving them as a burden, but they are perceiving themselves as a burden. 
and it is that feeling that stops them to come to you with this because they know that it will scare you they know that you might not be able to understand this and they don't want to burden you with all the heaviness that they are feeling when we talk about sense of low belongingness or social alienation it is also one of the symptoms people feel as if they do not belong to their family to the social structure to the friends and the circles and in fact even society and sometimes even to their loved ones their boyfriend girlfriend partner whoever it was which also leads to social alienation basically isolating themselves so they also do it in order to not hurt others so in their heads the perception is that by removing myself from everybody's life i am saving them from the hurt that i am going to cause them by killing myself or hurting myself now let's talk about suicidal capability it is the acquired ability for lethal self injury we understand that burdensome and low belongingness can be risk factors but they only together cannot lead to suicidality so these are very huge risk factors but also the capability to injure oneself lethally is also to be understood by ability to lethally injure their, yourself i mean procuring arms procuring things that can hurt you sharp objects pills drugs a lot of alcohol or any other toxic substances even poison and such uh, you'll also see um, in many adolescents who have, who have hung themselves you'll see in data you see that they have been preparing for it by measuring dupattas in india unfortunately so yeah the ability to injure yourself and you'll see a lot of trial and error before the actual act you'll see that they have tried to hurt themselves they've tried to cut themselves they've tried to um, in fact eat some poisonous pills or even prescribe drugs even paracetamol or any other off the counter drugs too the more the ability to lethal self injury the higher the risk the intent the acts of preparation towards making a suicide attempt but before potential for harm has begun so this is if i may put it lightly like a recon as you see in your beloved shows and everything so they do a whole research for themselves you know for the longest time the one of the very uh, common searches on google was how to commit suicide nowadays we don't call it committing suicide because it has been it's improved it's not illegal anymore but still one of the very common researches on uh, google used to be how to commit suicide or how to kill myself thankfully now when you search it you get a list of helpline numbers and that has become updated so when a person has the intent or the intent is increasing or as we say it as the hopelessness is increasing more and more every day they are looking and planning towards the act so in planning and looking towards the act similar actions you might see you might see people actually uh, making a will or talking to friends saying their goodbyes or just appearing very happy suddenly because they've made the decision now let's also talk about the buffer and or the connectedness or the protective factors what are the protective factors against the detrimental impact of negative life events on suicidal ideation one of the best factors could be somebody listening a friend a family member who just lends a listening ear a better family cohesion of course some purpose towards work or family in life because purpose always gives them the drive to do something and some positive events some positive reinforcements and of course support and if treatment is available then the best now let's talk about referring when you take a person to a mental health professional the best kind of referring is when you accompany the person 
because that makes sure that the person has taken help, at least did the first step. You know, as we do in therapy, we always say the first step is the hardest. When you're going to have your first therapy session, that is the most anxiety provoking. That is when you always get scared. This person is going to know all about me. No, your therapist doesn't know all about you. So, coming to the second type, when you can't take the person, but you ensure that the person agrees to see a professional or promises that they will go in the future, coming near future. And the third type, when the person agrees to take help in the future, but keeping in mind that the first way where you can take the person, especially the person is F, considering suicide actively, or you can see clear signs and symptoms, where they're talking about death constantly, they're closing up their work, they're finishing their chores, and they've stopped seeing other people, isolating themselves. So definitely take the person to seek help rather than just telling them to go and do that. Now I've written finding courage over there. It is because it takes a lot of courage to help a person who is thinking of suicide, who is thinking of ending their life. It is even scary for people to ask the question. It used to be scary for professionals to ask the question. There's a stats of uh, NABH, I think, where it says that most of, at least 90% of the population who ends their life with suicide have seeked some kind of medical help within the last one month. So imagine that even professionals were so scared to ask the question that are you feeling like harming yourself? Are you feeling like life is not worth living? That nobody knew that they had any ideas of suicide or any ideas of self-harm. Generally, as we discuss further into our talk, the myths about suicide and asking the question, one of the biggest myth is if you ask the question, you are implanting the idea of suicide or self-harm into the person's head. It's not true. In fact, the opposite is true that if you actually ask the question, it is more likely that the person is going to say yes if they are feeling that way. And is going to be ready to seek help. Because understand that the idea is that they are seeking solution. And when you are seeking solution and you see somebody is there to give you that solution or probably give you support towards the solution or a different solution, then definitely why not? If I ask any of you that have you ever thought of ending your life? Any of you ever? I've thought of it. I'll come out. I'll th I've thought of it. I think everybody has thought of it sometime or the other. Life gets tough for everybody. And it's okay. It's perfectly fine. The point is that we are not ashamed of it. And the point is that all of you are here and thank you for the ones who raised the hands. It shows that it is still a semicolon. And we can believe in prevention. So, yes, it is a very, very courageous act. It puts a lot of responsibility on the person who is doing the act of help or just taking the person towards help. And yes, it must be scary. And it is scary when we see people who are thinking of suicide, who are thinking of harming themselves. At least in the earlier times of my career, I used to be scared. So, I'm sure it's scary. Now, the biggest thing, and I always say this, we are only responsible for what we know at the time that we know it. Yes, if you understand today is somebody who is thinking about suicide, who is thinking about self-harm, you can take them to help to a mental health professional or even a hospital, but only when you know about it, yes. You cannot blame yourself for not knowing. So that is one thing I want you all to understand and also one that although we all want to help those who are thinking of dying or who are thinking of ending their life but also understand that in most cases we might be successful but in some we might also be unsuccessful and that's all right. If you ever hear about suicide by your family members, students, somebody around you, colleagues, friends or just the whole line of hopelessness, helplessness or any acts Always act then and there. Don't wait. Reach out and take the action then and there. 
Now let's talk about how to approach a person. The first is, first and foremost, is to acknowledge the person's distress. We cannot hope that we go to a person and say that, okay, whatever you're feeling is not okay. You know, don't think of dying. Don't think of cutting yourself. Don't think of ending your anxiety by slitting your wrist. You can't. You have to acknowledge their distress. You have to understand that what is the anxiety? What is the distress? What is the reason that is driving them towards the solution of literally killing themselves or ending their life? Humans are technically programmed to evolve, to rather live happily, you know. Even in the times of cancer or any other very disastrous terms also, we find ways to find hope. Imagine how much weight is on the person's shoulder and in their mind when they think of ending that hope. That hope doesn't exist anymore. So imagine if suicide, depression or anxiety is it bigger than or worse than cancer? It's not treatable definitely. But imagine if the weight is higher sometimes. It is. It takes away one thing. It takes away hope. So yes. Do acknowledge the person's distress. Also create a very safe ambience to talk. And when I say create a safe ambience, it simply means a very supportive environment. I'm here and I'm listening. I'm here and I'm not judging. Even if you think that you cannot help, you can help to find help. Always know that. This is a bit indirect method of asking somebody if they have been thinking of suicide, if you're worried in asking the direct question that have you ever thought of killing yourself? Like I ask the direct question to all of you. That have you ever had the thought? That is direct. If you're scared of asking that, you can always ask, have you been unhappy lately? You can also ask, do you know when people are upset as you seem to be? They sometimes wish they were dead. I'm wondering if you're feeling that too. It's an open question. They can feel it. It's all, it's all right if they're not planning it. It's in fact good. But if they've thought it, that is an indicative of need to seek help. You can also in fact ask if things are too bad at office. Things are too bad in life in general. Do you like your life currently? Is life too difficult currently? Or things like, do you ever feel like you don't get up in the morning? Or... Is it too difficult to get up in the morning in the first place? What are the thoughts that come to you in the morning? Let's talk about the art of persuasion. Listening. I'll ask you a fun question. What do you think is easier, speaking or listening? Speaking. Yeah. <laughs> I'll disagree for a few moments here because I am scared of speaking here. But still, yes. Speaking is easier and listening is more difficult. How many times do we actually listen actively? And we're so preoccupied with giving our opinions. Yeah. And it's so easy to zone out. Yeah. Yes. It's because if you're quiet and actively listening, it's also easy to zone out. Yes. It's also easy to start judging in your head. Yeah. Oh God, what is this person talking about? I'm short. Right? Active listening is a gem. If you master it, half the problem of the world is done. So, yeah. The biggest art of persuasion is listening. Listen first and then think of persuading. Because if you don't listen, you don't know the issue. You don't know why this person is thinking about suicide. Why such a fatal outcome, you know. How will you know? And if you don't know the problem, what kind of solution can we provide if you don't know the problem? None. I could just share there's a marketing technique to deal with the irate client where the uh, marketer kind of just nods his head and keeps saying, I understand, I understand. You know, I think that might help also in this kind of situation. Not really, no. A person going through mental health issues will catch you doing that. 
trust me and especially if it is an adolescent i'm saying that because we are specifically uh, you know talking about youth here they catch you like this there's nobody smarter than them trust me any of my patients who are in this age group they can catch rubbish from a mile i'm not using the word i want to here but they can catch rubbish from a mile if you give them this kind of yeah yeah i understand then actually end up you don't understand at all so they know very very quickly and because it's not genuine hence it becomes a problem and it will rather push them towards not asking for help so that's true so they catch you from a mile honestly i'm telling you never say i understand to your kids if you don't understand the problem you might as well say i cannot understand what you're saying and they'll try to make you understand but be honest about it especially if it is about distress especially if it is about a problem you think is pretty big for them never say i understand if you don't understand it just say you just help me understand this better because i can't get it and that's perfectly fine for them they'll be more than happy to tell you what they're talking about in fact in rather detail there are so many slangs and language changes nowadays happening i don't understand most of them when the when i'm in therapy with the adolescents because the adolescents my god they're intelligent so yeah i cannot say oh yeah i know exactly what you're talking about i don't at times so i have to ask them that what are you talking about can you just tell me what this means because i don't know i'm too old for this so yeah and it's perfectly fine they take it very well yes ma'am So, uh, um, in therapy, in fact, we are trained not to use this word. Yeah, absolutely. Because we can't really understand what they're going through. No, so we, we can try. Yeah, we so can try. So I always so clarify. Well. I don't exactly. No, no, no. That's okay. We are not. Uh, Rather than being judgmental and saying, "Yeah, you think me? Why are you thinking like that?" As you said in the yeah. beginning. So it may, you don't have to use the word. I understand, but you may just nod and you know look eye to eye and not be distracted by your phone. Oh, definitely not something. be distracted by your phone. No, yeah. definitely. All right. Now, just simple things on active listening. Give your full attention. Do not interrupt and only speak when the other person has finished. Do not rush to judgment. Please, please do not rush to judgment. If you think an adolescent is behaving badly or is trying to cut themselves or is thinking of killing themselves because they had a break up do not laugh do not feel as if it is something very light very small for them it is normal or for the person that problem is big and it's okay that the problem is big even though the problem might not be big for you or me or anybody else but that's perfectly fine so keep the judgment i don't know just throw it away it's not needed don't condemn the idea of suicide so don't go like ye kharab hai ye to karo hi nahi aisa to socho hi mat aisa kaise bol diya so a lot of times i see parents who are very very tense because the person is talking about suicide and we are genuinely just talking about suicide and the parent is like aap baat kaise kar sakte ho is bare mein don't talk about it don't say such things So by saying that, what you're doing is you're actually closing the safe space that you were trying to create for the person. Be it a child, an adolescent, or an adult. The moment we say you don't talk about it, you're on guard. Anything anybody will say that to me or Zal, you're on guard. So don't condemn the idea. Just say, okay, this is one thing. All right, what else? Tame your own fears so that you can focus on the other person. like i said earlier it takes a lot of courage to talk about it it takes a lot more courage to actually hear it from somebody who you know if it's a friend it's a family member it's very 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 scary so keep that fear aside for a moment when you talk to them because in fear there is a possibility that you might say something that you actually don't need to or want to even so keep that fear aside i know it is difficult it's easier said than done but keeping in mind yes so that last slide was actually a beautiful summary of what we call compassionate listening yes absolutely the goal of talking to the person is to say yes to help all right the only goal of persuasion is to say yes to help nothing else not too big not too small just yes to help 
Yes, I am okay seeking help. Yes, I would like to talk. That's all. Now the biggest question, what if they refuse to seek help? That doesn't mean you failed. You can always provide a person with helpline numbers. In fact, if you think somebody is actively suicidal name, but in the action of, you know, harming themselves or you know for uh, sure that, okay, they have procured items or you know the risk is very, very high, you can even report it and that's perfectly fine. Though a courageous act and also the worry that you are breaking somebody's trust. But in this case, take the action. Alright? These are the few helpline numbers. You can take a note later also or I can just give them to you later. Now, persuasion works best when we persist. Suicide is not a good solution. Understand the key word here is solution. That it is not the only solution and it might not be the best solution. Alright? We are not saying that you are wrong. Your idea is wrong. You don't know what you are saying. We are saying okay. There might be other solutions to this. Not just ending life. Suggest a better alternative? Definitely. Focus on solution to problem and not the suicide solution. So like we said earlier, that understand the problem first. Because suicide is a solution. It's not just a random act. It's never a random act. Now accept the reality of the person's pain. Then offer any alternatives. Alright? First is acceptance. First is saying it's alright that you have these problems. And it's alright that they are overwhelming you. How many of us had really, really horrible presentation anxiety or such? Social anxiety. Or even, um, yeah, so common. And it is overwhelming. Somebody might be okay standing on a podium and, you know, just going on. But some of us might not and it's alright. Some of us might be okay making new friends, some of us might not and it is overwhelming from them and that's fine. They might just be very good artists also or anything else. They might just be good writers or anything else. Why do we have to put them in a box? We don't. Offer hope in any form and in any way. It could be in the way of talking. It could be in the way of taking them or accompanying them to a mental health professional, a hospital or any form ever. Or just sitting silently with them. The toughest. Yes. Now as the rattling information I have given you. 4.5% increase in youth suicide in last year. So where in 2020. One person was dying every hour by suicide. We still have a 4.5% increase in 2021. So let's talk more about youth suicide. So first, because we're talking about young people and a lot of stereotype comes around young people. Parents end up thinking, feeling because they're also distressed. A lot of myths. So I know all of them are myths. But if you think or disagree with them, you can always raise your hands and we can discuss it. The first one. People who threaten suicide are just seeking attention. What do you think about it? It is one of the most common ones, right? We must have heard it. From somebody or the other. Right? You had something to say? Okay. So, we have heard it, right? That some parent or somebody, or just randomly, somebody is giving this opinion. I think, jo log na bolte hai, wo log karte hai. No. It's not true. Alright? It's a myth. They're just saying it so that they get the attention to get the help. Talking about suicide or asking someone if they feel suicidal will encourage suicide attempts. That is one of the biggest questions I get from students, I get from parents and family members and everybody. So when we teach them, okay, it's alright, let them talk to you about it. That today I am feeling this. Today I am feeling like cutting myself, can you sit with me? But parents are so anxious that if we talk to them about it, they'll just do it. Then not. Especially if you're open to talking about it, they see it as an opportunity to express that pain. And that just might turn out like a very good management skill. 
that when they're feeling that low and when they're feeling that they cannot control it anymore, they can just come to you and talk to you about how horrible they're feeling. That makes for something. Young people who talk about suicide never attempt or die by suicide. this point, I mean, one thing that always makes sense is if talking about suicide was such a surefire method of people committing it, yeah. um, asking a parent, you know, your big fans of Sachin Tendulkar and Amitabh Bachchan, but you've not achieved anything in those spheres. Talking about it has not made you a good cricketer or anything of that sort, so why would suicide also work that way? Uh, harsh, but true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, young people who talk about suicide never attempt or die by suicide. Very, very untrue. Please do not fall for it. That ye adult, ye, one line I keep hearing nowadays, ye generation hi aisi hai. Puri generation hi suicidal hai. Isa nahi hai. Bahut sochti hai. Kyunki ye loog pure day hai phone pe rehte hai, isliye sab depressed hai. Isa nahi hai. Just see their environment. Just see what they're feeling. Suicide attempts or deaths happen without warning. No. There are always warning signs. If a person attempts suicide and survives, they will never make a further attempt. That is way, way far from the truth. In fact, when a person is even hospitalized and when discharged, there is still risk. There is still risk. We are not saying that 100% this person will go home and not harm themselves. Aisa nahi hai. In fact, if they've not, you know, if they've not achieved good amount of health, then it's highly likely that in one coming one month there could be another attempt or there could be another self-harm action. Or another planning again. So one attempt doesn't mean that okay, up to is so I've heard people say this that up to is me. Seek liya hai. You know, the pain. But no, the psychic pain is way higher than the pain that the physical body is experiencing right now. The solution is bigger. So, no, that's not true. Once a person is intent on suicide, there is no way of stopping them. Absolutely wrong. There are ways, there are ways to everything. Rather. So that is the whole idea where suicide prevention is set upon, right? A lot can be done. A lot can be done. By simply just talking about it, by simply seeking help, that's all. Only certain types of people become suicidal. No, any of us can have the idea. Any of us might find life overwhelming at any point of time. Any of us might find that thought in our head one day that life is not worth living. So not certain types now. Recent comments I've heard about depression. Nowadays children sit in AC classrooms that are depressed. How are they depressed? Suicide is painless. No, suicide is not painless. The person who is attempting it, the person who is harming themselves, know that it is not painless and still choosing the pain. So like I said earlier, imagine the weight of the problem on their shoulder or the perceived weight, you know, to understand that. Depression and self-destructive behavior are rare in young people, highest in young people. <laughs> because of sheer impulsivity present, that's why. Especially in adolescents also. Because they're more impulsive by nature, Due to the bi biology of their brain, not that, oh, adolescent may ye hota hai, ya teenagers aise hote, but because of the biology, because of the hormones, because of the neurology of the brain, that makes them highly susceptible to impulsive behavior. So, which could be a thought out thing for an adult, it could be an impulsive action for an adolescent. All young people with thoughts of suicide are depressed. Now, that one is conflicting, right? Not all suicidal ideation comes from depression. I know it sounds weird. The impulsivity oh, that you just yeah. mentioned. Yeah. A lot of it is to do with impulsivity. A lot of it also to do with anxiety. A lot of it also to do with not being able to 
trying to rear or channelize anything. Abuse? Abuse, yes. Abuse is a huge risk factor, especially in adolescence. Because one, when we talk about abu abuse, it's also one of the taboo topics, right? People don't talk about it. Adolescents don't think that it is okay to talk about it. There is no safe space, really. Right? Uh, few uh, weeks ago, an adolescent patient of mine told me that a counsellor in their school actually went ahead and told their parents about all the relationship issues she was having. And that was the reason of her going towards the ideas of self-harm and wanting to kill herself. So where are we really creating a safe space for the young people? Marked in sudden improvement in the mental health state of an attempt. Following a suicidal crisis or depressive period signifies the suicide risk is over. Far, far, far from true. Because this actually might signify that they have taken the final decision. They have collected all the means. They have taken the final decision. And they are ready to attempt it with higher fatality. Once a young person thinks about suicide, they will forever think about suicide. No. Because there's a lot of mental health issues that are under, you know, playing in the background when one is thinking of suicide. So imagine, you can just treat the mental health issues. And most of them are treatable. Young people thinking about suicide are always angry when someone intervenes. And they will resent the person afterwards. No. Suicide is much more common in young people from higher or lower socioeconomic statuses. There's a myth that children from higher socioeconomic strata have more suicidal ideation. No, neither the lower ones. It barely has any role to play, especially in young population. Especially when we talk about young adults. Rather, no role for it's just a justification thing, it's, people yeah. blaming the other strata. Yeah, it's just, oh, hamare nahi hota ideology. So, gender? Gender, uh, you'll see that the completed uh, deaths are more in males, but attempts are more in females. That's cross-generation. Cross-generation, that is because, maybe because of strength, it's also seen that because of lack of ability to seek help in men. There's also reasons that uh, you can see depression and anxiety in men in the form of anger and restlessness and a lot of rage. So it can be mistaken as that, oh, this person is just generally angry. So that is why it goes unidentified in men a lot of times. So mostly around male suicides, you'll see the idea of, acha kisi ko pata hi nahi tha. Ye to hum soch bhi nahi sakte the ki this person is depressed. Or this person was thinking of suicide or killing themselves or ending their lives. There's a lot of those ideas around it. And let's face it, even people who are from the psychology background, think of your ratio of people you see in a therapy chamber. How many men you see and how many women you see. How many women come to seek help and how many men come to seek help. And is it easy for men to seek help? It's not. It's really not. Also owing to the fact that we also have a lack of male therapists. Okay. Talking about warning signs. Now I'll take your opinions on this because I've already discussed this. Let's see. Warning signs. Let's say in youth, what are the warning signs you might see? Because you're young people, hence. Missing school, yes. What else? <coughs> like you just said, sleeping all the time. Sleeping all sleeping the time. Themselves. Avoiding any pleasurable things, yeah. avoiding play, avoiding meeting friends, not going out, even if it is movie or anything. Yes. You know, there was this girl uh, who uh, hung herself from the fan <laughs> and just the day before that, she was posting her very pretty pictures on Instagram. Yes. And she had got a nice haircut yes. and she was posting pictures. That is what we call the high before the. That is what we were talking she was about. Also going for therapy. Possibly. Yeah. So I think this can also. I don't know. But this can happen. Definitely. Signs now. Being See, too happy or being very. Yes. Yeah, too happy all of a sudden is a warning sign. 
too happy like a haircut like you're sending posting their very pretty pictures and uh, you know calling up friends and i'm very happy today and you know just perfect life is perfect that is a very uh, big red flag not happy when doing pleasurable things emotionally drained sleeping a lot general sadness hopelessness hollowness young people often report hollowness i feel empty is what they say so if they say that that means there's a huge emotional distress that they are experiencing uselessness they also quote in fact saying that sab useless hai mai bhi useless hu life useless hai so those terms start coming in their vocabulary mostly missing school like she said by quoting medical issues or upset stomach or such change in appetite very high appetite or very low appetite lethargic sleeplessness headaches joints or back pains these could be signs of depressive episode or even high anxiety even if not directly suicidal behavior yes ma'am i don't understand how can joint or back pain be a Ma'am, many times you will see that in young adults, that uh, for a very long time they are facing distress, depressive symptoms, or even anxiety can manifest as pain, bodily pain, muscle pain. It can manifest as that. Easily irritated, uncooperative, disagreeable, avoiding social interaction, avoiding or skipping school, abusing drugs or alcohol, focusing. on finishing the tasks or finishing the chores you know khatam kar rahe hai sab kuch jo bhi unke haath mein hai performing consistently they were generally consistently performing now there's an inconsistency there's either a, you know regardless behavior ki it's all right i don't have to do this work i don't have to appear for this test or i'm not interested in studies anymore where the person was actually very interested now let's understand a few protective factors Let's start as we are done. Ma'am, uh, locking yourself in the room is it related? Locking. Locking yourself in the room is definitely indicative of some distress. So definitely indicative of seeking help or towards seeking help. It's recommended, but might not be necessary. Protective factors could be genial parents, easy to talk to, family environment, easy to talk to uh, teachers. Counselors present easily, or just an open environment. Uh, Goal-directed behavior could be protective factors that you have to do this at this point of time. Children who think of the future is a protective factor that I want to become this, want to do this, I'm working towards this. Thank you.